Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag, the all mailbag edition here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your questions. I'm one of your hosts. My name is John Campy, and I'm joined by uh, the very stressed out uh, <laughs> Josh McCuga right nice now. John. John, I hope when people watch this on Saturday and Sunday, a uh, little disclaimer, we, we shoot these on Thursday, that the Penguins are in the Stanley Cup Finals. If not, uh, you won't see this cup on the desk next week. Yeah, I mean, it's it's game seven tonight. This is Once again, this is Thursday. So mm -hmm. by the time you watch this, it will have been settled. You're either sitting at home celebrating and raising a glass with Josh McCuga, or you're laughing uh, at him and me <laughs> because they are my second favorite team. But, I mean, if they have the... It's been an interesting it's, series. It's been, it's been something, John. Hell really of a series. It really has been. All right, guys. Well, like I said, this is the show where all we do is take your mailbag questions. A more laid back, relaxed kind of a vibe here. And how do you get a question on our show? It's simple. Just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send them on in. Every day, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk, we take one or two mailbag questions. And here on the weekend... That's all we do. But you can also, you know, Facebook me messages, uh, tweet me, whatever. I collect questions from all over the place. So, and I believe too, they send them into your personal account, Big Hot Canadian Boy, uh, Harvest backslash Toronto, right? That's uh, yes. <laughs> That's exactly where they come to. I'm going to come up fact. with a new, uh, a new, new personal every email week, every week. Just every week, a new email address. Yeah, there you go. Everyone's going to look forward to that. <laughs> all right. The first question for today's show comes to us from Thomas Williams, who writes. I found myself looking up the National Treasure box office numbers and was a little surprised at the results. The first film made $350 million globally, and the second one made $457 million. Disney is constantly trying to find magic in the form of epic franchises, i.e. The Lone Ranger, Prince of Persia, and John Carter, with a $100 million improvement from the first one to the second, and a headline actor like Nicolas Cage. It seems strange to me that Disney let that one go. I was just curious, if there was ever any news about a possible third film back when the second one was released. I, I felt a, a sense of sarcasm there with what? headline actor Nick Cage. What? <laughs> did, I, did I sense some sarcasm in there? My job. voice? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. How am um, I not in that movie? You know, uh, I, I thought National Treasure was okay. The first one. Yeah. I, and I even had, I mean, uh, uh, Helen Mirren joined the second one. I know. I'm yeah. saying. I thought it was okay as well. It was interesting, whatever. But it was definitely a big hit with a lot of people. A lot yep. of people love that franchise. And there was talk off and on for a couple of years about number three. Why didn't it? Because on this show, we'll often talk about trajectory. You know, it's like, hey, the first one made this, but the second one only made this, and that means the trajectory is like that. So why would a studio, be, you know, want to run out and do a third one? With National Treasure, the trajectory is this. It, the second yeah. one made more money. Do you think it became like became because it became such like a popular meme? <laughs> Of being like a punchline of like, I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Uh, if anything, that would have helped it. Right. I think, yeah, yeah. You think that would have helped it. I think there are two things that were the culprit. Number one, I think the genre started to get played a bit. And by that, I mean, you look at uh, what was the first one? Uh, the Da Vinci Code. Uh -huh. So you also got movies like Da Vinci Code coming out and stuff like that. Plus, I, if anything, I think you, you said a big headline name like Nicolas Cage. I'm always going to be a Nicolas Cage fan. Like to, the, the guy has Oscars on his mantle for sure. a reason. Mm -hmm. And when he wants to be, he's still a damn fine actor when he wants to be, but he is not a draw anymore for whatever reason. I'm not going to go into the, you know, whatever reasons you may think he's, he's kind of a punchline now or not. I'm going to always think he's a Personal super talented life, actor. I mean, Ghost Rider two, uh, Ghost you know, Rider one, Ghost Rider. Uh, the <laughs> 20 straight to DVD movies. Correct. He's done. Uh, uh, I mean, he, he's in the tablets all the time for the weirdly wrong reasons. Not uh, a lot lately. No, but every time you see him in Vegas, he's with, uh, Vince Neal and Carrot, <laughs> Carrot Top. Top. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely, yeah, you know, it, there isn't, I feel like Nicolas Cage kind of painted himself into a weird corner of mm. celebrity and, and it's weird how personal life can really affect box office. Cause if you look at when Tom Cruise first came out and he was super Scientologist, right. it really hurt the box office numbers And that mission impossible three, they all were saying that, you know, had, had Tom Cruise not come out and jumped on a couch and gotten all weird with Scientology that he, that, that mission impossible three may have done much bigger. Well, numbers. You know, I think the first, I think I could be remembering this completely wrong. I didn't look into this. Okay. So I, I, I don't know if I'm remembering this right, but I think the first movie to come out after the whole couch jumping stuff mm -hmm. was war of the worlds. 
Yeah. And I remember, okay. and that box office, was, it, don't, it didn't bomb or anything like that, but I remember it fell well short of their initial expectations. That was a huge budget movie. And I don't think, honestly, I don't think Tom Cruise really recovered mm -hmm. until he did the most genius thing for his own personal rep. He did uh, Tropic Thunder. Yes. Les playing Grossman. Les Grossman, one of the great characters I mean, probably ever. And it, it literally resurrected his career overnight. A top five cameo in a movie ever. And it really wasn't a cameo. It wasn't even a cameo. No, it was, it it was, was a small was, role. Yeah, small yeah. role. But with, I mean, grade A talent and such a departure of a role for him that to me, and I think 90% of the movie going audience was like, eh, eh. We're getting completely sidetracked. Sorry, sorry. But what That's happened to the Les Grossman movie, remember? I know. There was, they, they, they were talks that they were going to actually do a Les Grossman movie. I was salivating in the mouth for that damn thing. And, and it, it Justin never Thoreau came. was supposed to write it, too. Yes, yeah. yes, it was. Yeah. And it never actually happened. Nope. So I think, yeah, I came down to a couple things. I think they just thought, there's probably nowhere else to go with mm. this. Oh, uh, the Statue of Liberty now has secret carvings they ran on out the of American bottom of its, yeah, yeah, the bottom of its foot. And the fact that I don't think they felt comfortable running a franchise anymore with uh, Nicolas Cage. Again, right or wrong, it, for whatever reasons, whatever, but... Is uh, it weird that I thought there were three National Treasure movies? Well, you know what, that's the, that just goes to, to the point that there was a lot of talk about a National yeah. Treasure. I think you'd probably find some people out there who thought there was a National Treasure three because they talked about it for so long. Yeah. But it is weird that it never happened. Seems like a trilogy franchise. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Bobby Hoskins, who writes... Hey, Collider crew, I'm wondering why Peter Parker slash Spider-Man could catch Tony Stark's attention, but not Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, etc. I can understand why the Netflix Marvel heroes wouldn't be in the MCU because they are smaller level heroes. Uh, there could be those types of heroes in every city, I guess. But since they are all in New York City, how does Tony Stark or Captain America not know about those heroes? It's, it's, the simplest answer is this. Something I've been telling you guys forever. They're two totally different universes. Yeah. That yes, in the in the Netflix shows, you'll hear them reference the incident. <laughs> you'll see a newspaper clipping on a back wall. They'll they'll be those little things, mm -hmm. but for all intents and purposes, they treat them as two totally separate worlds. Yeah. You'll like you never hear the MCU reference the Netflix universe, and only in the very most veiled. Like uh, subtle references, will you hear the Netflix shows reference the the wider MCU universe? Yeah. They essentially treat them as two separate worlds, and I don't think. And ever since, um, Perlmutter and uh, Kevin Feige, you know, Kevin Feige used to work under Perlmutter. He used to be the head of like all Marvel Entertainment. Mm -hmm. Well, then about I th I think it was about six months ago they had an organizational shift where Kevin Feige no longer worked for Perlmutter. Apparently those two guys didn't get along much. So Kevin Feige now directs reportedly to the CEO of Disney okay. and he runs the movie universe and Perlmutter is still in control of all the television properties. Now that those guys have parted ways, I don't think you're going to see them tie the television and movie way worlds closer likely. together. I think they're going to keep doing it the way they is. So the reason Iron Man hasn't showed up on Daredevil's doorstep or Luke Cage or Iron Fist or Jessica Jones is because Marvel just treats them as two separate worlds, really. And if we're gonna, if you want me to take the other flip side of things and say, let me let me just go practicality. Let's let's do, uh, you know, two buddies arguing at a lunch table of why why doesn't he find Spider Man? Well, listen, you have a guy who's swinging from buildings via spider webs, and another dude who's blind fighting with sticks. It's it's a little bit different <laughs> of a superhero. Yes, Luke Cage is bulletproof, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's again Spider Man, iconic swinging. But but hero. but Ian, he's not that iconic because in that world, the MCU, he still he's, yet. he's just started a few yeah. months ago. He started doing it, and Luke Cage was in the was in the national news. They were all they're talking about Luke Cage, like the yeah. hero of uh, of, hero uh, of Harlem. Uh, Harlem. That's what it was, and it never really. Now look, if they're ever going to have any crossover between the two, if they are ever going to do it. Infinity War is the place. Yeah. If you're because look, Infinity War, they seem to be looking for an excuse to put every single freaking character they can think of in there. If they don't put any of the Netflix heroes in there, and I don't think they will, but if they don't, then you ain't never gonna see no. these guys cross. This is the perfect opportunity if you really want to do that, and I don't think they're gonna do it. No, I think it's it's so weird to think that they do mention the incident, right? Yeah. And they do, and there are like harkens to the MCU, but we never really get an interaction. Why even mention it? Why even? Yeah. Why even have it? But like, no one's ever mentioned. Like Rosario Dawson never mentioned. 
maybe we should contact the Avengers. Right. Like never, never said this is not going to happen. Yeah. So, and then I heard today that Rosario Dawson is getting close to joining the new mutants movie. So um, now she's crossing all over the place. Yeah, so now she's in the non-Marvel Marvel <laughs> character. It's getting a little kind of complicated. The cashing checks. But I mean, really, real. you've watched all the... Do you think the Netflix shows suffer from not being more connected in with the movies? Absolutely not. No, I, I think the Netflix shows are... In, I think Daredevil Season 2 is the best... Daredevil Season 1 is great. Daredevil Season 2... Is even I think greater. ...is, is fa absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so good. Jessica Jones is good. Luke Cage and the rest of these these series thus far, I think, have suffered from fatigue, meaning there's too many episodes. I think they are better served as 10-episode seasons uh, because you, I think, in, in Luke Cage, you lost you lost Cottonmouth, you know, spoiler alert, if you've seen Luke Cage, I, I mean, what are you doing? Um, you lost your If you your haven't villains. seen Luke Cage by now, you're not interested in watching Luke Correct. Cage. Correct. Um, you lost your main villains early and, and the most charming of villains and, and the guys that you were kind of rooting for in a bad guy kind of way. Same with Jessica Jones and definitely the same with Iron Fist. Iron Fist was an absolute train wreck. Had they actually scrunched that into 10 or even eight episodes like they're doing with Defenders, I think you get a better series. But again, suffering without the MCU? No. See, I, I'm, I'm one of, I know a lot of people hold the opinion you're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are smarter than me hold the opinion <laughs> that... Uh, you know, too many episodes. I, I disagree. I look back at some of the greatest, the great all time TV shows and they had 23, 24, 25 episodes a season. It's you either know how to plan out your season and your stories and, and fill a season or you don't. And I would argue that Iron Fist was such a mess. That thing could have been four episodes long <laughs> and it wouldn't have been any better. You're not I mean, it wrong. was just badly handled that yes. one. And so and, and I agree with you. I don't think the Netflix, if anything, I think the Netflix heroes feel more special because there's not a superhero on every corner. Correct. And I kind of like that. They it makes Daredevil feel more special without the Hulk running around and without Thor flying it through the sky in the background and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and and true to what the Netflix TV universe, the Marvel TV universe, none of them fly, right? They're not like flying fly. people. So you have a little more, no pun intended, grounded superhero. Yeah, and you know that's the other thing. Reminds me, Luke Cage. If they were ever going to try to really draw more connections. Luke Cage in the in season one of Luke Cage, he's on national television attacking cops, a super powered being attacking cops. Yeah. Don't need any of that. No, no, we don't need heroes. We'll just uh, <laughs> we'll just send more cops with guns that won't do anything to him yeah. after. Like if you're going to do anything at that point, you say, hey, maybe we should send Captain America. Maybe we should get a hold of Iron Man. Maybe <laughs> we should get a hold of Ant-Man or something like that to go and deal with this problem. But nope, no mention of that whatsoever. Not at all. Just a super just powered guy incident. walking around. Yep. All right, let's move on to this. Anthony Knives writes... Hi, guys. Uh, Christian mentioned a possible Flash Gordon remake. Would you keep some elements from the original Queen soundtrack? Love to hear your opinions, and thanks for the amazing work you guys do. What about you? Like, I hate Flash Gordon. Really? I cannot stand that movie. I understand the guilty movie pleasure aspect of it. I understand that it's, it's hokey and that it's in that weird 80s, early 80s movie kind of era, but... The only thing you keep if you remake Flash Gordon is the Queen soundtrack. I think the Queen soundtrack is fantastic. Queen is is a quintessential rock band, but I think the actual Flash Gordon I, it, it just doesn't interest me at all because I dislike that original movie so much. Um, I am kind of with you. I don't I don't hate the Flash Gordon okay. movie. I don't see the appeal. Like yeah. oh snap. Goes crazy for that right. flash score. I don't see the appeal. I know Ted Mark Wahlberg totally go for it. <laughs> I, uh, me personally, I don't see that big of a appeal. I don't think it's bad, but I don't see the appeal for it either. But I'm going to say the very unpopular thing. You don't use the Queen soundtrack. Really? Okay. Because here's why. Most of today's movie going audience have never watched that Flash Gordon. Yeah. So most of the today's movie going audience has no association with that and the Queen soundtrack whatsoever. Also, a lot of the demographic of today's movie going on, it's like when they did Flash and did Queen, that was them using contemporary music mm -hmm. in the movie. True. If you're going to do Flash Gordon today, you'd probably make, use contemporary music. I mean, I just don't think today a lot of the, and this is a sad thing, not a lot of the younger moviegoers today have have no idea what Queen is, no. other than that piece on the chessboard. They God. have no idea what Queen is. And that's and a shame. So I just don't know that there'd be a purpose. I mean, maybe as a... Um, Easter egg sort of thing mm -hmm. you put in a, a, a few hits of Queen music just as a wink to those who do remember the original Flash Gordon I feel like the only the, maybe a lot of the millennials know Queen from is the scene in um, uh, Shaun of the Dead 
that would might be like in in yeah. Winchester. You know what I mean? Uh, but Queen's music in Flash Gordon is one of the only redeeming facts for me of that whole movie. But you made a really good point. Is a lot, if not most, of the movie-going audience, the young movie-going audience right now, has no idea what Flash Gordon is. So why do a remake? You're not going to get some huge audience. Yeah, unless, I mean, unless you have a completely great idea just for a great movie, regardless of the fact that it's called Flash Gordon, mm -hmm. and you base it around Flash Gordon, and you market it right and all that kind of stuff, uh, maybe it can work. But you know what? Would here's a here's an interesting question. Going back to the Queen thing, Tom Brady plays Flash Gordon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Would we even? No, I'm. Just, I, this is an honest question. Would Wayne's World the movie be one half as popular were it not for that iconic scene near the opening of the first film where they sing Bohemian Rhapsody? No. I mean, because that's that song kind of defined that whole thing, right? That that and for me, I didn't know what Bohemian Rhapsody was right. because I'm, I'm I was like at nine years old, ten years old when Wayne World when Wayne's World came out. So I'm watching. I'm like, oh my god, this song's incredible. When downloaded, listen to the first three minutes. I'm like, this isn't the same song. And then the breakdown yeah. happens. You're like, wow. And then that turned me on Let to me Queen. Go. Yeah, and that turned me on to Queen as a whole. So that's an also a really good point because. Did I know who Queen was? I mean, I knew who their songs were, but I didn't know that they were by Queen. I knew what We Will, We Will Rock You was, and I knew right. We Are the Champions, but I didn't know they were by Queen. And then when that song came on, then Queen was introduced to me. So maybe the Queen soundtrack, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Flash Gordon remake, again, but we are already not seeing a Flash movie anytime soon. Yeah. So Flash Gordon is going to confuse more people, because when I was a kid, I was like, Flash Gordon, is that is he Flash's brother? You know what I mean? I it's There's too many Flashes. So this one's Flash Gordon, and this one's Flash Barry. <laughs> Is that what it is? No, that's not what it is. That's not how it works. All right, let's move on to the next question. Good. The next question today comes to us from James Stalmach, who writes, I watched the director's roundtable on The Hollywood Reporter, and Ridley Scott said there is a problem with too many sequels, prequels, and not enough original ideas, etc. <laughs> I just find it odd that he said something, but is now wanting to do eight more Alien films. Um, oh, the irony is not lost, John. Well, eight more Alien films. He's producing another Blade Runner. Uh, I mean, hopefully he doesn't do another Robin Hood movie. I, I don't know. How would you address I that? I hate coffee. I will have four espressos. I, I don't... <laughs> Ridley, what are you talking about, man? Your whole career at this point is making and remaking things. <laughs> I... Yes, I think we are in agreement. There are a lot of sequels and there are a ton of prequels and there are a lot of not so original ideas out there in Hollywood. But for Ridley Scott to come out and say that is really, really the pot calling the kettle black. What, what do you think, John? Well, look, here's here's the thing. I remember Ridley. OK, I love my dad. My dad is the greatest man I've ever known. Okay. I, I, dead serious. He's the greatest man I've ever known. And he can say some stupid ass shit from time <laughs> to time uh, in his life. But I, I love him and it doesn't sure. stop him from being the greatest man I've ever known. Ridley Scott will go down, you know, in the archives of Hollywood history as one of the greatest filmmakers 100%. ever. Yep. But he says some stupid ass shit from time <laughs> to time. Like, you can't talk like that. And then, and then in the midst of, well, first of all, you shit all over the other guy who was trying to do an Aliens movie, oh, man. killed his project. <laughs> Poor guy. So you can do three or four or five more, which is fine. That's his right to do. But here's the other thing. Remember not long ago, he started, he was like crapping on superhero movies. I remember a while ago, he started talking about it. He goes, uh, I mean, and to be fair, he's saying, uh, superhero movies aren't for me. He goes, I remember he made this quote once. He started, he was talking about uh, the first Blade Runner. He goes, if you take a world like Blade Runner, you could totally put in a Batman or a Superman in that world. But then this is what he says. Except I would make it a fucking good story. That's, that's what really Scott said. It's like, really? Like the counselor? Shots fired. <laughs> like Robin Hood? Like a good year? Oh, <laughs> like, man. Like, like, don't pretend you don't take. But then, at the same time, you know, uh, James Cameron, yeah. another fantastic filmmaker, started taking shots at Ridley Scott for stretching out the Alien franchise. Like, oh, why do, what's, what's the point in doing even more and blah, blah? You're in the midst of making four more Avatar four. films. Four! Four! <laughs> Even Rocky Five was shitty. <laughs> what the hell? Come on. What is the one with Tommy Gunn? Yes. I didn't the, mind that. I, I didn't mind. I didn't mind Five. No, here's the, here's like the problem with Rocky Five, and here's going to be the problem with all these aliens. All right. Is you are just running the same story over and over again. So the more hokey the story gets, the more jaded as an audience we're going to be. We he Rocky. Won the Cold War in a boxing ring in four. <laughs> if I can change, yeah. if you can change, we all can change. 
I would have been happy if that's where the franchise ended because he ended the Cold War, Rocky Balboa. He started a feud with a man named Apollo and ended it with a man named Drago. They just... <laughs> But you went on five and you fought Tommy Gunn in the street and you did a forward roll and you took out his legs. It's just, we never saw Rocky street fight before. I don't know why we need to see him street fight now. Alien, they keep going up there and the aliens keep eating them. <laughs> they keep eating them. So in the next one, are the aliens not going to eat them again? I, I, have, I have a feeling. Spoiler alert, the aliens are going to eat the people. Yeah, there you in, go. Further, in future movies. Alien 8, they're still eating us. There's the title, Ridley. Good luck with that film. <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Oh man. The next question, <laughs> <They're> still <laughs> eating people, comes from Leo Leor Morad, who writes, "I think it's safe to say that most Star Wars fans were expecting a Darth Vader scene in Rogue One, showing what a badass and menacing he is. Uh, we certainly got that. And so, for the Last Jedi, I really, really want to see a how powerful Luke is scene. What about you guys? And if so, what do you think it will be?" So he's asking, I think, if he wanted to see pre-release. He wanted to see the Darth Vader scene in Rogue One. Well, yeah, he's saying we got it. Like, we were yes. expecting oh, got it, Darth got it. Vader being a badass in Rogue One, and we certainly got, got that. It. So now he's saying, are, are, we looking, are, are we expecting the same thing for Luke in Episode Eight? I would be shocked if we did, because he couldn't have gone this far since Return of the Jedi and not gained some real Jedi power. Yeah. Because he was good in all the in you know New Hope through Jedi, but he wasn't he wasn't the super Jedi. Well, you know, no, although he did take out Vader, and yes, and if going by legends lore, like he ultimately becomes the most powerful Jedi there's ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, now, whether or not, how much of that they'll carry over into the movie world, I don't know at this point. But like for me as a fan, and I'm only speaking as a fan, okay, mm -hmm. just as a fan. Luke Skywalker is Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, in many ways. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the Star Wars saga is bigger than just the Skywalker family. It's but like, called the Skywalker Ranch for yeah, a reason. It's called Skywalker John. Ranch for a reason. Uh. Um, and you gave us Episode Seven, and you didn't give us Luke till the very last moment, and you didn't even let us get to hear a line. Shame on you. Now I get it. I get it. That's fine. Then you you got some making up to do with yep. episode eight. Yep. I I want to see Luke Skywalker taking some fools to school. Yep. I really want to see him do the moment Luke lights up a, lights up a lightsaber for the first time to go in and fight. You you look so, like that's foreplay with your fiance. I'm just I'm doing <laughs> I'm doing force moves, John. I'm oh, force is that moving. what that yes, is? Yes, it's yes, force yes. moves. Okay, totally fine then. <laughs> um, I I I just got to see it. We I think they've got to have it. And the fact that they put that Vader scene in Rogue One mm -hmm. tells me they know that the audience is yearning for this type of stuff. We've been waiting not just since Episode Seven. We've been waiting since the Return of the Jedi for Luke to really let loose, and we want to see that in action. If you're going to show that Vader, you got to show it to us, Luke. I think. And what do you think? Well, I think uh, we mentioned a couple weeks ago. You mentioned the super spoiler, and I'm going to tell everybody what it is right now. <laughs> no, no, no. Luke <laughs> kills Jar Jar Banks in a music video. Uh, it, it's a total out of the world. You don't even see it coming. It's a Jar Jar Binks <laughs> rap music video in Walk Skywalker, chops Jar Jar Binks in half, uses his... No, I I think that, that Luke Skywalker is going to have that jump up out of your seat, standing ovation Jedi moment in The Last Jedi, and it's going to blow the doors off the place. I really hope so. Yeah. I really, really if hope they, so. If they didn't, I, w I would honestly walk out of the theater a little bit disappointed, a little butthurt. Yeah, it depends how good the movie. I mean, I suppose there's always episode nine they could do it. They, maybe they're holding on to that for episode nine. I don't know. But we'll we, where did where did we see the Yoda jumping around lightsaber battle? That was in uh, the second one. Clones, right? Yep. So no, maybe. All right, we move on now to the last question of the day, which comes to us from Kevin Ray, who writes, "I'm loving the new trailers for Spider-Man: Homecoming. We still don't know too much about Zendaya's character." Over or under 50% that she is related to Miles Morales and used in some way to introduce him into this MCU. Thanks for taking my question and all the great shows. I, I would think that would be a genius move by the MCU, by Disney, by everybody. Um, if Zendaya was a, a portal into the Miles Morales universe, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. 
And I think it's actually pretty great. There is one problem with it. What's that? Um, the the character Miles Morales does not belong. The rights don't belong to Disney. They belong uh -huh. to Sony. Okay. And Sony seems to have plans for Miles Morales of their own. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be, as most of you guys know by now, they Sony is releasing an animated Spider-Man film that is not Peter Parker. It's okay. going to be Miles Morales. Mm -hmm. And I have a theory, and it's only a theory. I have a theory that this new Spider-Man less universe that Sony's starting. They just announced this the week Venom. that Silver Sable and, and Black Cat, they just got a director for their movie. That's coming in 2018, maybe 2019. Venom with Tom Hardy is coming in October of 2018. I have a theory that while the Peter while Sony is working with Marvel and Peter Parker in the MCU, I have a theory that Sony may then utilize and bring in a Miles Morales Spider-Man into their uh, universe that they're and they're two separate universes from what everything they're telling us and so I think that would probably preclude now that's not saying it's definitely a no mm -hmm. I mean maybe it is and that would be great but it seems like at any rate that Sony is using the Miles Morales character they're already doing a solo uh, animated film that's confirmed and I have the theory that they're probably going to maybe bring him into the live action thing with their Venom and Black Cat and all that kind of stuff there so I think all that would kind of preclude Miles Morales or any connection to him coming out in uh, in the MCU, but you never know. I love you where your head's going too. I love that Miles Morales in, in the Sony MCU. It would, it would like, for a lot of people who are like saying, and I get this, because I am actually for Sony doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're trying something different and they're trying something out of the box. And I think sometimes you got to do that. You got to take a risk and stuff like that. Christian put it perfectly. He said, you know, go big or go home, give it a shot. And I think it can work, but you know, for a lot of people who understandably would be saying, but how do you have a Venom without, without Spider-Man? Even the look of Venom is based on his hate on for Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. How do you have all these types of characters without a Spider-Man there? And I, I think Sony, again, it's just a theory. I think Sony has a plan for that. And I, and since they can't be Peter Parker, I, I think it might be Miles Morales. I don't disagree at all. I think it's actually pretty great. I think it'd be pretty great. All right, guys. Well, that'll do it for us for this installment of Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget, send on in your questions anytime to collidervideo at gmail.com. And make sure, above all else, you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Click subscribe. Take this video. Share it around. Let everybody know about Collider Video. Put it on your Facebook, on your Twitter, wherever you like to post this type of stuff. I want to thank the guy joining me today. Of course, Mr. Josh McCuga. Thank Josh, you, where can John. people find you? Uh, you guys can either find me uh, on top of a mountain screaming the word penguins or uh, <laughs> at the bottom of a bar in a well somewhere uh also at josh mccuga on twitter and instagram collider tv talk every monday we are off this monday for memorial day but we will be back in june and of course you guys can simply follow me on facebook and on twitter just at john campia that'll do it for us guys thanks so much for joining us until tomorrow bye bye